as the artists sang, in ways that I cannot comprehend. There are so many things about Jesus that I can't comprehend. We're going to be talking about one of them in just a few minutes because it's really been on my mind and my heart for the last week. The second phrase that I think a lot about is that day. When I hear that, I immediately, immediately think about a day in the future. I think about that day when Jesus returns and gathers his church. Then I stop and I ask myself, why do we have to wait? What if God's plan is for the church to be gathered together, functioning as one, right here, right now. Finally, for now, because I'm going to be referring back to this again during the next few minutes, but for now, the words set apart by the grace of you. Those words force me to realize that it's only because of the grace of God that I'm different. Let me say that a different way as well. Those words force me to recognize that by accepting that gift of grace, I have no choice but to be different. To be set apart by that very grace. There are two things related to our faith and our responsibilities as followers of Jesus that I believe are difficult for most of us to comprehend. The first is one that we do our best to recognize and acknowledge here, and that's the Holy Spirit. For many believers, the Holy Spirit seems like a concept of Christianity rather than a person of the Trinity. Much of the lack of understanding comes from the fact that our minds aren't able to even understand a three-in-one God, let alone a spirit that lives in us. Even though we don't truly understand the Holy Spirit, we do give the Holy Spirit a fair amount of sermon time in our churches. We talk about the Holy Spirit, at least here at Walton Hills Church of Christ, on a regular basis. The second difficult concept that I see in the church and in the world, and the one that I want to talk about this morning, is grace. Most of us have heard grace defined in this way or in a similar way. Justice is getting what we deserve. Mercy is not getting what we deserve. And grace is getting what we don't deserve. I think that, I believe that's true, yet I think it goes much deeper than that. I want us to consider today not only what grace is, but why grace is. When I ministered in Illinois, part of my weekly schedule was to lead a Bible study for just a few high school aged young people. And when I once asked them what topic or what book of the Bible they wanted to study, they told me that they wanted to learn more about grace. I've been reminded of that lately because of what's going on in the world today. I started this year talking about ripple effects, and we've seen the ripple effects of the pandemic, and we've seen the ripple effects of the political landscape, and I have to tell you that one thing that I've noticed is sorely lacking in the world, and even in the church today, is the ripple effect of grace. Let me get back to those high school age students that I mentioned a minute ago. I have to admit that I was caught off guard when they told me they wanted to learn more about the concept of grace, so I asked them the obvious question, why? Why do you want to know? One young girl said to me, I'll never forget this, she said, and this is not an exact quote, but she said, because we don't feel like we see it in people, so we think maybe we just don't understand what it really is. I have to tell you, I was saddened and overjoyed at the same time. Saddened that they couldn't see it or recognize it. 
overjoyed that they recognized that something was missing. And they wanted to know more about it. We used a written study of grace based on a book by an author named Philip Yancey. You may have heard of him. He's written a lot of books. This particular book that he wrote was titled, What's So Amazing About Grace? As we prepared to study this thing called grace, I encountered something that Yancey wrote that is just as real today as it was when he wrote it nearly 25 years ago. And this is a direct quote. He wrote, grace is the most perplexing, powerful force in the universe. And I believe the only hope for our twisted, violent planet. End quote. Church, I firmly believe that the only way a person can extend grace to another human being is by knowing that he or she has received grace. What I fail to understand is how a human being can know, can receive, can experience God's grace and then not be willing to, not, not only be willing to, but not strongly desire to allow other people to experience that same grace. To be the vessel for God's grace. Even the people who we deem just as undeserving as God once deemed us. There are so many mentions of grace in the Bible, and it's not surprising that the most prolific user of the term is the Apostle Paul. I mentioned that to somebody once, and they told me that it was only because Paul wrote most of the New Testament letters, number one, and that Paul had a habit of repeating himself, number two. Both of those things are true, by the way. However, I don't think it's a coincidence that God inspired Paul to write all those letters. I don't think we can overlook the fact that the letters were written to the church. And the fact that Paul repeated his feelings on grace so often harks back to what we've said here before so often. If it's repeated, it's important. If it's repeated in the Word of God, there's a reason for it. And while God's grace is important to everyone who accepts it and receives it, I'd suggest that grace was no more important in the history of mankind than it was to this apostle. Think about it. We're going to read about it. If there was any, ever anyone undeserving of God's grace, it was a guy named Saul of Tarsus. We're first introduced to this man, Saul, at the end of the seventh chapter of the book of Acts. This is the story of the beginning of the church. This particular part tells of Stephen, the first New Testament martyr for the faith. The first one to stand in the face of death and declare Jesus as his Savior. And in response to the words of Stephen, the author writes... At this they covered their ears, and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed him, dragged him out of the city, and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. Then continuing in chapter 8, it says, And Saul approved of their killing him. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Now you read that and you may think, who is this Saul? Where did this evil man come from, and why is he so adamant on destroying the church that Christ himself has established? Well, if you don't already know, this is actually one of God's guys. He's a Pharisee. He's a leader in the Jewish community and a teacher in the church. 
And as shocking as that may seem, he wasn't the Lone Ranger in that regard. In Saul's defense, the Pharisees as a whole had pretty much rejected Jesus because he threatened the status quo of their positions and their place in society. He truly believed that he was doing God's will. That he was protecting the people and driving out this small group of fanatics who were misguided by this man named Jesus. He is, however, about to have an encounter with Jesus that will change the course of history. Not only the course of his history, but also the history of the Gentile people specifically and the history of the church overall. As we read on through the rest of chapter 8, we're told of the work of the early Christians continuing even though they had been scattered by the persecution. Then we get to chapter 9 and we read what sound like familiar words already. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. Breathing out murderous threats. Can't you just imagine the venom in Paul's words, the intensity of his actions? He went to the high priest, it goes on to say, and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. Saul not only wants to continue his crusade against the followers of Jesus, he wants permission, letters from the high priest granting him the right to do so. It doesn't say so in scripture, but we can assume that the letters are written the permission is given because we next find Saul on his way to this place called Damascus. And it's here that we find the story of Saul's encounter with Jesus. It's a familiar story to many. Beginning with verse 3, it says, As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but didn't see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. I can't help but assume that at this point, Paul has not seen anything that he considers grace. I can't help but wonder what he must have been thinking during those three days. Did he wonder if this was the end for him? Did he think Jesus was about to unleash the punishment that in reality Saul truly deserved? Or would Saul be spared because he truly thought he was doing what God had wanted him to do? We don't know. What we do know is that Saul is about to experience God's grace. What I think we often miss is how that grace is administered. Listen to this, church. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias? Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. This next Ananias part is us, church, in so many ways. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority 
for this, from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. Basically, Ananias is saying, wait a minute, God. Are we talking about the same guy? This guy certainly can't be trusted. He certainly isn't deserving of any blessing. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. There are two things that strike me here. First of all, Ananias could have said no. Second of all, Ananias might have went because he just learned that Saul was going to suffer. He was going to suffer for the name of Jesus. Verse 17, then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord, Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. I want to stop there and remind you that I said I would get back to the words of that song that we sang in you in just a few moments and we're there now because I want to repeat that chorus. In you were the hungry feast at the table, the blind frozen by colors in view, the lame will dance, they'll dance because they are able, and the weary find rest. The weary find rest in you. I would suggest that Saul experienced all of those emotions, everything that's conveyed by those words at the very moment he experienced God's grace. One more thing about what we just read. Did you catch the fact that God used one of his agents? A man who obviously wanted nothing to do with Saul. God used that man to pour out his amazing grace on the very man that Ananias had deemed undeserving. Let's be Ananias in the world today. We can't miss this church. Look at the ripple effect of his actions the ripple effect of his obedience, even in the midst of something that he surely didn't understand and that as a human being he really didn't like and wasn't happy about. And look at the ripple effect of Saul's not only recognizing God's grace and accepting God's grace, but also in all of those letters that we talked about earlier and in all of those instances that I mentioned, sharing his story with others who also probably felt undeserving of that grace. That's why the apostle talks so much to the churches about the subject of grace. It's because he knew just how amazing that grace was. And he wanted the followers of Jesus to not only understand that they had received grace, but that they were the vehicle, they were the vessel, they were to share that grace even with people they deemed undeserving. So now I pose the question, the challenge, if you will, what would the world look like? What would the church look like? What would the ripple effect be if every person in the world who claims the name of Christian would extend grace to everyone, regardless of opinion, regardless of argument, regardless of anything. I firmly believe, and I know that Philip Yancey does, that we have a much better chance at showing people what grace looks like than we do to explaining to them what grace is. In fact, he wrote, as part of the book that I mentioned, I would far rather convey grace than explain it. Before I pray and we have our closing song, I want to read one more quote 
from the praise pages of what's so amazing about grace. It says this, one who has been touched by grace will no longer look at those who stray as those evil people or those people who need our help, nor must we search for signs of their love worthiness. Grace teaches us that God loves because of who God is, not because of who we are. Grace, church, if you don't hear anything else I say today, hear this next sentence. Grace means that God already loves us as much as an infinite God possibly can. We are all trophies of God's grace, some more dramatically than others. Certainly, Paul was a dramatic instance. Jesus came for the sick and not the well, for the sinner and not the righteous. He came to redeem and transform and make all things new. May you go forth more committed than ever to nourish the souls that you touch, those tender lives who have sustained the enormous assaults of our universe. Wow. One more song lyric that I once heard wraps this up. The singer sang, once I got that call, no more Saul, now I'm Paul. Each of us here today has heard the call of Jesus. Now the challenge is to go with grace. Let's pray. God, we love you so much. Teach us to live with grace, to love with grace, to share grace with others because you've shared it with us. Teach us to love human beings so infinitely and so impossibly and so recklessly and so ridiculously that they might know your grace. Our minds really can't comprehend it and we have trouble conveying it. So let us live it so others might see it. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.